Thanks so much. Uh, fascinating, Neil, as always, um, and you know, inspiring to to follow that. And it's perfect setup. Um, so I'm Skylar Tivitz. I have uh, a few main roles. So one of them is I run the 3D printing additive manufacturing journal, and you'll see how that leads into some of our research. Um, we, when I stepped in from Hod Lipson, who started it, I was specifically interested to add the plus, meaning that it's obviously all things additive, but also what is the next form or where are we going in the future? It shouldn't be about what we think of today as 3D printing or additive manufacturing, but all forms of additive fabrication. And so that's why you'll see things like synthetic biology or knitting or granular jamming or many other things beyond just today's version of printing. Um, academically, I coordinate a program called the Design Minor and Design Major at MIT. So this is a, a new program for all undergrad students across the institute. You know, they may be majoring in mechanical engineering or computer science, and they can double major in design or they can be, get a minor in design. And this actually started with a class called How to Design, um, which is really a, a spin out of how to make. So, you know, historically, as, as Neil was talking about with how to make almost anything, um, courses have grown out of that, like how to grow almost anything and how to design was one of those courses. And then now that is the fundamental course, the start of this entire program on design. And by design, we mean all forms of design, not just product design or architecture, but fashion design, information design, interaction, uh, food, AI, machine learning. Like how do we utilize design as this sort of polymath um, graduates, you know, that we can then send off and become hybrid biology designers, physicists, designers, uh, have a kind of art and creative design aspect that they can blend to many other disciplines. So I coordinate that and teach in that program. But what I'm going to talk about today is the, the research at the lab. So I started a lab called the Self-Assembly Lab. Uh, I'm faculty in the Department of Architecture, and, and I'll talk about the different research thrusts that we have under that work. Um, but where I'd like to start is to think for a second what most people imagine when they hear the word smart products. Um, you can look at smart buildings, for example, or you could look at smart cars, smart clothing, um, smart planes, you know, smart anything. In terms of smart buildings, most people will think about the Nest thermostat. And that translates to any other industry or any other product that we now call smart, where we have a de device-centered notion of what smart means. So typically, we have a, a traditional building, we'll add a bunch of devices and now call it a smart building. Or we have clothing, we'll add a bunch of batteries and sensors in our clothing or our shoes, and we'll now call that smart. And I'd like to critique that or think about a different perspective on what it means to have a smart product. And a similar question, what do most people think about uh, when they hear future of manufacturing? I would argue most people think about this, that, you know, a bunch of robots in a factory, that the future of manufacturing will be more and more automation, more and more robots building things, whether that's cars, planes, or buildings. And I'd like to critique that today. And what we're really interested in is how do we build intelligence and this quote unquote smart capability, but without more complexity? How do we build that with simple interactions, whether that's through self-assembly and replication as Neil was talking about, or just simple material properties that respond to the environment? Can we find a way to build smarter things with less, smarter things with less components, less complexity, less uh, reliance on electricity and batteries and power, less failure, et cetera. If we truly want smarter things, they need to be more elegant, last longer, uh, sense, react, adapt, et cetera. So we're always thinking about what it means to be smart. How do we make those smart things? And when we do make them, what can those smart things do? Uh, I got into all of this, this world through architecture, and it was right at the moment when software was booming. This is the first CAD tool, Sutherland Sketchpad at MIT that obviously led to many, many different platforms computationally. In the design world, this is uh, generative tools that allow us to design things that we couldn't have designed before, simulation tools, analysis tools, uh, analyzing the environment, structure, performance, generating concepts that we couldn't have done before. So in this way, code and computation became a new tool for designers. And, and computation changed 
every industry we can think of. Um, and there's a similar analogy in digital fabrication as, as Neil was talking about. You know, this is the first CNC machine at MIT, the first time they connected a computer to a milling machine. And that obviously has contemporaries in CNC machining, uh, industrial robot arms, 3D printing, water jets, laser cutters, and all of the digital fabrication equipment that we know today. So from a design perspective, code became a new language to design things and code became a new language to make things. But I started to think about what happens after that. Can we have code for construction? You know, we can design these mass customized parts where we have unique components that go together with thousands of bolts and rivets that and gears to assemble. But realistically, we have all of the sophistication in software and fabrication, and we have almost no sophistication in construction. And so I became very focused on that. How can we rethink the processes of assembly, the things that we build and we put together from many different components, how do we assemble them in new ways? And how can we make the performance and the functionality of those things smarter and smarter? Initially, this was uh, actually, I was, I was a grad student with Neil, and we were under the DARPA Programmable Matter Research Grant. And so as Neil was talking about, we went from you know the millimeter to centimeter scale all the way up to the many meter scale I was looking at it from the largest end of that spectrum. How do we build robotic systems that could reconfigure, transform, self-assemble? And this was really critiquing construction in a way from my perspective. How do we build things in a new way? And, and one way to do that is to build smarter parts. So if you had smarter bricks that could assemble themselves or climb and transform, then that would be a new perspective on how we build things and how do we build smarter things. But I started to become critical of that as well. You know, if you think about scaling it, if you want to build many, many things or you want to build a, a building, for example, if every brick is a robot, that brick becomes super expensive, energy intensive, uh, fails more often. And there's a number of precedents in the architecture world of trying to build uh, with super, super smart components that fail after a month. So I started thinking, we want the essence of that, but it may not be robotics is the key. Could we do the same thing through materials? So we became focused on how do we embed more information uh, into our materials, but through material properties? Can we build smarter components? Can we build materials that have information, sensing, actuation? Can they reconfigure, transform, assemble themselves? through material properties? And what are the different fabrication processes that we can utilize to actually produce those material components? I showed this uh, because we're interested in the human scale processes of assembly. So whether that's construction and manufacturing or product assembly, shipping, logistics, distribution, like that's the spectrum that we're really interested in, this macro scale human world that we occupy. Um, and that's interesting for two perspectives for me. Um, number one, because of the background in architecture, this is the scale that we are used to and that we operate in, that we're interested in building macro scale things, which is quite different from most other people working on self-assembly systems, for example. You know, most researchers that you'll hear about working on self-assembly systems are at the uh, you know, biological, chemical, material science domain, so they're working on very, very small scale things. So one aspect of our work that is quite unique is just that we work at macro scale things from, you know, some centimeters to meters or kilometers is the, the length scales that we work at. And the other one is to critique how do we assemble at our human scale world. If you look at the smallest of scales or the largest of scales, as Neil was talking about in, in a number of examples, Design and assembly emerges from the bottom up. So, you know, there's no sledgehammers or screwdrivers putting together DNA, and there's no one printing out planets. There's no one designing a planet and then saying, okay, now I'm going to fabricate a planet. The design, the functionality, and the construction of the smallest of scales and the largest of scales happens from the bottom up. It self assembles and self organizes, function and construction emerge, design emerges through the interaction of the components. But if you think about the human scale, everything happens from the, the top down. So we design and imagine things as designers or as teams of engineers and creators. We then send those instructions to people or robots, and we then in, inform them to fabricate things. So everything is designed and fabricated from the top down. And I became 
uh, interested in why that was and is there another model that we could design and build from the bottom up but at the human scale. So there's three topics of research that we explore. The first one is programmable materials, very much building off of what Neil was talking about. Can we build more and more information and programmability into our material systems so they have agency, so that they can physically transform, they become highly active as sensors and actuators, but in the materials themselves. And this all started with a project in 2013 called 4D Printing. The idea was that we wanted to essentially print those robots that I showed you, the reconfigurable robot that we're working on, we wanted to print that from scratch. How could we use multi-material printing as a way to print self-transforming structures, essentially print robots without the wider, wires, motors, and batteries, or could we print smart materials uh, but we can customize those smart materials where we can change the amount of material or the material property in different locations and we can get the structure to transform. So we introduced this topic in 2013 and we print with different material properties. We dip them underwater and then they transform. They, they go from a, a line into a 3D object, into a cube, for example, or a line into the letters MIT or a surface that folds into a truncated octahedron or a flat sheet that folds into curved crease origami, and that was done with Eric and Marty Domain at MIT, or a flat sheet that can locally expand and contract, and they can morph into double curvature. So there's no manual forming or stitching or cut. And so, for example, you can have a flat sheet that morphs into a specific shape. And all of this is done by printing it with different material properties, dipping it underwater, and then it transforms itself. But one question kept coming up after we introduced that work is, how do we do this with other materials and with other fabrication processes? You know, it's not just about plastics and it's not just about 3D printing. So that's why we started to call this programmable materials that it's beyond the, the simple project of 4D printing. We really wanna be able to program and activate any material with any fabrication system. So whether that's uh, textiles, wood, plastics, rubbers, foams, metal, et cetera, with many different forms of fabrication. And the way that we do that is a couple simple ingredients. So we take the materials and the geometry. We think about what are the material properties of the structure that you're building? Is that wood? Is that carbon fiber? Is that metal? Is that textiles? What are the properties of that material? And how do you fabricate them in a way with specific geometries or specific combinations of material properties so they're activated by an, uh, an energy source? So we know that wood will be activated by moisture, for example. With the moisture, it'll swell the cellulose, the wood will then curl, and you can get some mechanical transformation. You can get some behavior from some sensing and innate capability of the material properties. And so we use these ingredients in a way to embed the information into the material properties. We can fabricate those, and we can get them then to become alive, essentially, to transform in repeatable ways. And I use the example of wood because there's a long history of wood being an active material. You can go all the way back to Japanese joinery uh, or shipbuilding or like wine barrels, for example. And they would use the swelling property of wood to swell, expand, become more precise, watertight, stronger joints. Or more contemporary example, Eames furniture, uh, famous American designers used moisture and temperature to steam bend plywood into shape. And Aki Menges's group at the University of Stuttgart uses um, wood veneer to open and close based on the relative humidity in the environment. But the two challenges here in the Eames example is that there's a lot of energy into forcing plywood into shape. It's not that the plywood wants to be that chair. They have a mold and they force the plywood into the shape that they want. So they're not really taking advantage of the property of wood. And in the case of the wood veneer, you're limited by the grain that you can find in the forest. And so what we started to do was actually print with wood. And by printing with wood, we get the property of wood. The cellulose is in the fiber, uh, in the extruded the fiber, and then it's going to swell based on moisture. And what we can do is design our own grain. So we can print with any arbitrary 2D or 3D grain pattern that you wouldn't naturally find in the forest. So when we dip the, water, the wood underwater or we change the humidity of the environment, the wood then curls based on the grain in 2D or 3D. 
So we have different grain properties and then the wood behaves like it can fold into 90 degrees, for example, or you can get furniture like shapes. You can get all sorts of behaviors of wood that you wouldn't naturally find in the forest. So we take the properties of the material printed in very specific patterns and get this new capability. We worked with uh, product designer Christoph Gubrin, who we do a lot of work with, and uh, developed this project where we print flat. So one of the critiques of, of 3D printing often is the higher you go in Z, the slower it is, and the harder it is to compete with existing manufacturing. So if we can print flat, we still get the capability to customize it in sort of two and a half dimensions. We can create different grain patterns and different thicknesses. It's very fast. And then we can put it in a Ziploc bag with moisture, ship it anywhere in the world, and essentially then the transportation becomes the activation. So when you open it on the other side, it then morphs into this much larger bowl and basket. So the three-dimensional structure would be quite complicated or difficult to print, time-consuming, et cetera. Instead, we print it flat, ship it, and the shipping allows it to activate when you open it on the other side. Another material that we've worked with is carbon fiber. Um, and this actually started with the collaboration with Airbus, with Neil's group. And um, Airbus approached us because they saw some of the carbon fiber work we were doing in a similar way to the 4D printing or in the wood activation, we would take flexible carbon fiber and we would combine it with different polymer layers in different grain patterns based on the weave of the carbon fiber to get the carbon fiber to morph based on temperature or moisture. So the way that we do that is, is we lay out these rolls of carbon fiber. And then we either print with different patterns on top of it, or we can bond or laminate uh, or even weave into the carbon fiber these different polymer layers. So by changing the grain direction and by changing the material, we can get different activations. So we can get carbon fiber that folds repeatedly based on temperature change or based on moisture change. So we have this reversible transformation. And now we take carbon fiber that's typically thought of as high performance, super strong and light, it now can be high performance in the sense that it can sense and actuate. It can be a smarter component without more motors and pistons and pneumatics and hydraulics, et cetera. So with Airbus, we developed this component that goes inside the top of the engine that brings in cool air. Uh, you want to bring in the cool air to cool down the engine, but it causes drag because it's a hole. So this flap without any extra uh, components and weight and potential failure, you have a single sheet of carbon fiber, which is you know, effectively the most minimal uh, addition that you could make to the engine. It could then open and close to control the airflow to the engine, either based on temperature differential or pressure differential. So how fast they fly or slow they fly creates a pressure differential inside and outside, allowing it to open and close. Um, we then started developing ways to take sheet materials and slit them into macro scale fibers. So these are reversible temperature activation. It's roughly 30 to 40 Celsius. Um, they're anywhere from a few millimeters to centimeters in width. We slit these sheets and we recombine them into these macro scale textiles. And this allows us to build what's called auxetic structure. So typically when you have a material and you stretch it, it'll shrink in the other dimension or when you compress it, it'll expand. Uh, auxetic structures are uniformly expanding or contracting. So we can take a material and program it so that when there's a temperature change or sunlight, it can then expand or contract in specific ways. So this could be useful for uh, packaging, or we were thinking about garments that can open and close based on temperature or sunlight or breathability, for example. And that then led to a whole series of research under an organization called AFOA, Advanced Functional Fibers of America, where we're doing exactly that, but through fibers and yarns. So we use an industrial knitting machine and much like a 3D printer, instead of printing droplet by droplet, we swap out fibers and yarns with different material properties and we do that stitch by stitch across a garment. So every single stitch can be a different material and it can sense pH or moisture in this case and transform in color or shape or it can sense temperature and morph as well. So we can change the material properties and we can change the behavior of the textile by different fibers and different knit structures. So we have different levels where we can uh, modify the behavior or the activation. And there's essentially three main goals. We wanna be able to change porosity for breathability or waterproofing. We wanna be able to change thickness for insulation 
and change shape for comfort or fit. This um, example is looking at tailoring. So you can take a scan of the body. You can use that as a tool path for a, a robot. The robot then can follow the contour of the body and activate the garment. And you can do that to custom tailor it for color or pattern or aesthetics, but you can also tailor it for custom shape. And there's a big movement to make custom products like mass customized um, garments, for example. The problem is it's really difficult logistically to go from some body scan to some code to knit somewhere in the world to make that and ship that. It's really difficult still. So what we were proposing is you can mass produce small, medium, large, but we can activate it in the store so we can get a custom tailored garment, even though they were produced in standard ways. And it's very much like the ski boots that you may know. There's certain products where you put the ski boot on, you heat it up, and it'll morph to the shape of your body. And we're doing that with textiles alone. Uh, so we can knit that into the garment to morph to the shape of the body. Beyond that, with Ministry of Supply, a local uh, men's and women's clothing company, we've been working on active textiles that change to uh, modify comfort throughout the day. So you'll go indoors or outdoors, you might be running or walking, you might be cold or hot, and the garment should be able to adapt based on thickness and porosity change. So to do that, we developed custom fibers with multi-component extrusions. So we made all of these different cones of different combinations of materials with different cross sections. We then knit with those custom fibers. We knit in two dimensions and three dimensions with different knit structures so we can get these kind of behaviors. So we can make the textile bulk in thickness to give different insulation values. We can change porosity for breathability. We can change three-dimensional shape to create slits and openings. And we knit uh, on the industrial knitting machine like I was talking about before. We change those materials. Sometimes they're you know, stable, off-the-shelf, static yarns, and sometimes they're the active yarns that we use. And in combination with one another, they can then push or pull in different zones. So we can knit a garment that has different zones. Some are activated by moisture or body temperature. Some will change thickness or some will change porosity. And these are knit uh, from scratch, from the fiber all the way up to the garment as one piece. So you don't have any cut and sew. We can then make you know, lapels, or you can make sleeves, or you can make pockets and knit uh, all the way. And so there's effectively zero waste. There's no cut and sew uh, and very minimal labor. It's really just comes off the machine with these custom behaviors, custom properties in the knit material. More recently, Ministry of Supply uh, has converted all of their factories to only making uh, masks now. So translating some of that research directly into PPE and COVID related work. And so we've been supporting them as much as we can on that. And they're donating all these masks. Um, I think there's been something like 30,000 masks donated so far. And so they took uh, directly what we were able to do with knitting. Uh, they would typically knit a sweater or a blazer and it has all of these features knit from scratch. You can customize the blazer that you want with colors and fit and everything. And now they're translating all of their factories to just knit masks. Uh, and they have a replaceable washable filter or the whole thing's washable and then it's an inserted filter. Um, and this is really trying to address like the larger public when, they're, when, they're, um, when we're all released and able to leave our houses, everyone is likely gonna need masks. And so they're trying to fulfill that demand. The second uh, category of research is on phase change, how materials go from solid to liquid and liquid to solid. So rather than a shape change, can we get materials that change their characteristics? And one of the most recent projects that we've done is a new printing process called rapid liquid printing. This originally started with Steelcase, the furniture company, and we developed a new uh, printing process to try to print very large scale things fast. We print into a vat of gel. The gel supports the object so there's no effect of gravity. We can print in three dimensions without printing any support material. Uh, we can change speed or pressure on the fly. So much like calligraphy, we can then have different thicknesses and the material cures underneath the gel. So by printing in three dimensions, we can print very, very fast. Uh, we can go as fast as the machine can go and we can print with unique material. So industrial, off the shelf, standard, high quality materials like silicone for example which is like medical grade or food safe it has thousand percent elongation uh, we can print easily large-scale structures 
So um, tens of centimeters or meters. We have the biggest machine we have is a five foot by ten foot machine. So we can print very large scale structures uh, very very fast with these high uh, high elasticity soft materials like silicone. This is a project we did with BMW that was looking at uh, the future of comfort, where you could have cushions and car seats that morph to the shape of your body. Uh, they can provide lumbar support or ma massages or even crash protection potentially. So you have a single sort of meta material that, that, can, that can then morph to the functional demands of the body just by changing the pressure inside in different zones. And so, you know, this is very much aligned with a whole field called soft robotics. Um, and we're able to now print fairly complex internal structures with different material properties and different thicknesses in our liquid printing process. And with Christoph, the product designer, we then translated that into a whole series of products for uh, home goods or, or offices like chandeliers and wall sconces and table lamps and toothbrush holders and pen holders and pendant lights. Uh, there was a whole series of the product, these products produced where we can do different transparencies, different material properties, et cetera. More recently, we translated this into high temperature material. So, uh, we basically have the exact same process, but instead of gel, we print into a powder bath and we print with molten metal. So we take metal, uh, it then is heated up and liquefied. We print into this powder bath, it instantly cools, and we can print meter scale metal structures in seconds. So this is even faster than the previous because there's no chemical cure time and it's 100% recyclable. So we take these metal structures, we can then melt them back down, print it over and over and over again, and we can print um, large metal structures relatively quickly. So the typical challenges in metal additive manufacturing are that they're small, super expensive, and weak mechanical properties. So you can think about this as essentially like sand casting in three dimensions. We're, we're just doing exactly the same thing like sand casting, but we three-dimensionally deposit it essentially printing these uh, with the same structural capacity as, as a typical sand cast. So um, we can print with low temperature metals and now we print with pewter and we're working towards zinc and eventually aluminum is the goal uh, as we climb higher and higher temperatures. Another technique that we utilize is granular jamming. And typically that has to do with particles inside of a bladder. So you pull a vacuum on particles, they then become stiff. Uh, we did a project with Steelcase on reversible packaging. So essentially a blanket that has styrofoam beads, you can jam it around a, a table or a chair, ship it, release it, and it becomes a reversible packaging system instead of styrofoam that has to be wasted. Um, but we had a much more interesting project with Grammatio Kohler where we looked to utilize granular jamming for construction. So we found a way to combine rocks and string. So loose rocks and gravel with simple uh, fibers like string can promote granular jamming. So in Chicago at the Architecture Biennial, we built a large project where there's a yellow bounding box and we layer rocks and string, rocks and string, rocks and string over and over and over again. The robot is spitting out the string in very specific places so that when we remove the bounding box, all the rocks fall away that didn't have string and only where the string was do the rocks jam. So they jam because the rocks take compression and the string takes tension. So there's nowhere for them to go. The forces are equalized. They literally get stuck and become this load-bearing structure. And at the end of the exhibition, then we just wind up the string and the whole thing disintegrates. So as Neil was talking about reversibility, um, one of the biggest challenges in construction is that it's a one-way process typically. So think about concrete. It's great because it's a liquid, but then it chemically cures as a solid and you have to destroy it, you can't reuse it. So in this case, we can pour it like a liquid, it's instantly solid, so there's no chemical cure, it's instantly load bearing and it's 100% recyclable. So at the end of it, you get a pile of rocks and a spool of string, you can build it over and over and over again, disintegrate it, reverse it and build it again. And the last category of research that we focus on is self-assembly. So as the lab's name suggests, we're very interested in new forms of construction. So not just about transformation or phase change, how do we have material components that actually assemble themselves? So new forms of manufacturing and construction. 
And the most simple example of this is a project that we did with a molecular biologist, Arthur Olson. So you shake this glass flask, you shake it hard and all the parts break, but you shake it a little bit softer and they come back together. This is um, modeled after the polio virus. And we did a bunch of different biomolecular structures showing how um, without any information, so a person can be blindfolded, a little kid can pick this up or an adult can pick it up without any prior knowledge, they randomly shake this thing. As long as you get within just the right threshold, just the right amount of energy, it'll assemble. So it shows that the blueprints are in the parts, not in the person. Like typically during construction, the person needs to know everything about it, or you need to have skilled labor or a skilled robot to assemble things. In this case, all of the information is in the materials, not in the person. We then went a step forward to show that you can do arbitrary human designs and you can have unique components. So every component in here is unique to build the chair. Or we went to large scale components like weather balloons that can assemble in the courtyard to make lattice structures. So these are filled with helium. They float around in the courtyard. They make different cubic lattice structures. They have Velcro nodes. And then when the helium dies after a number of hours, it comes back to the ground and you're left with this big space frame structure. And we, so we were really trying to critique typical forms of construction where you have very specific machines, uh, lots of manual labor. And you know, there's a lot of examples of where that typically wouldn't work. You can think of extreme examples in outer space or underwater or disaster zones or hard to get to sites or even urban conditions where it would be particularly useful to find ways to assemble things without our traditional means of humans, robots, and machines. Couldn't we enable our materials to assemble themselves? But all of this self-assembly work um, we were doing for many years, and we really thought about it as basic research, you know, somewhere between an art studio and a science lab. Like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could? Like, would it be possible to self-assemble? What if we change the material components? What happens if we do it underwater? What happens if we do it in the air? It was, you know, quite abstract, really thinking, and I think this is where academia is really good, that we can explore these kind of fundamental questions to see what's possible without having to be tied to perhaps profitability or functionality all the time. And so I, I really categorized this re research in that world. But then more recently, this became very, very real. Um, we were offered the opportunity to collaborate with a group in the Maldives. They knew about our self-assembly work and all, all the self-organization systems that we've been exploring underwater. They invited us to come out there to try to think about how we could utilize those systems to tackle some of the challenges that they're facing in terms of sea level rise and climate change. And typically there's a few main approaches. So one of them is if you have storm inundation or sea level rise in a coastal area or an island nation, you can build barriers. The problem with this is that you're essentially trying to fight nature. You're trying to build a bigger, stronger wall and it almost never works. There's a lot of research to show that barriers and jetties actually do more harm than good in beach erosion or during storm inundation. And oftentimes nature is going to win. It's gonna overcome the barrier no matter how big and strong it is. And the other common approach is dredging. So they use this uh, very much in the Maldives and, and any coastal location. It's essentially you suck up a bunch of sand from the deep ocean and you pump it back on shore. Um, and there's a number of problems with this. It's really harmful for the environment. It's super energy intensive. Uh, it's really destructive. And the biggest problem is that it doesn't actually solve the problem. It becomes an addiction to dredging. So uh, every coast needs to do this year after year after year because it doesn't actually want to be there. And they do the same in the Maldives. They can build an island from scratch in about a month uh, using dredging, but that island doesn't want to be there. So they have to continually dredge to make this happen year after year. It's really not a solution, it's more of a Band-Aid. And what we became fascinated with when we were there is that in the same amount of time that it took them to dredge that island, man-made construction, three sandbars built themselves. And so we became very focused on why do sandbars form, and these are massive amounts of sand. These are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of liters of sand that form themselves. They self-organize in very specific regions for very specific reasons. And we started to think about if we could understand why do sandbars form, you could potentially collaborate with the forces of nature and cultivate it. 
you know, Neil was talking about self-assembly or self-organization. If you do it in a naive way or if you let it go out of control, it's not particularly useful. You need to collaborate with it. You need to cultivate it. And that's exactly what we started to think about. If we could collaborate with the forces of nature, we could actually promote sandbars to form in strategic places. You could rebuild beaches or grow islands to try to protect against sea level rise or storm inundation. So we started to study all the different reasons that sandbars form. Uh, There's many different reasons, but essentially it comes down to the relationship between the force of the water, so waves and currents, with the bathymetry, the topography underwater. So the geometry underwater in relationship to the waves accumulates sand in certain regions. So what we're proposing is to work with the forces of nature to build rather than destroy. In our lab, we set up wave tanks where we place different geometries underwater and we pump different wave patterns to see how that promotes the accumulation of sand. So we try to find the ideal shape of the bathymetry, the geometry underwater with the wave patterns in order to promote the largest accumulation of sand. So that was a kind of cross-section model. And this is a, an aerial view where we have a geometry on the right-hand side. The waves are pumping, growing the beach on the left and growing a, a sandbar in the middle. We then uh, have now done two field experiments. So we take the best of what we see in the lab. Uh, we then translate it to large scale. So this one is 20 meters by four meters. And we uh, do two of those, so large scale bladders um, that are then fabricated and we flew to the Maldives and placed them underwater. So these, um, the lab experiments are trying to study, you know, in hundreds of times, different geometries, different wave patterns. The field experiments are much more expensive and complicated and challenging to do, but it's 100% the real environment with the real forces. So there's you know, nothing really that compares to that. So we've now done this twice and we're We have a National Geographic grant to do this two more times. Um, Recently, we started to get some of our first results from the last field experiment. And what we're seeing is over the course of four months, we've had about a half a meter of sand accumulation, which maybe doesn't sound that much. But if you look at the scale of this, this is a half a meter by roughly 20 meters by 30 meters. That's something like 300,000 liters of sand, that new sand that accumulated in four months. So it's really uh, quite exciting on our end. You know, it's, it's quite preliminary and this is a very long-term project. The goal is that we do a series of these field experiments with hundreds of lab experiments and simulation, deploy them off the coast of the island or the coast. And as a season changes or a storm comes from one direction or another, you could promote the accumulation of sand instead of the erosion of sand. And over time, we could perhaps grow these islands so they get larger and larger Uh, to overcome the effects of sea level rise. So where do I think all of this stuff is going? Um, To me, it all comes back to the, it is true, we should still be building with smarter material capabilities that can collaborate with those robots. So materials that can respond, sense, actuate, make informed decisions, assemble themselves, collaborate with robots. Because essentially we have robots who are great at precision and repeatability, don't get tired, We have people that are great at flexibility and creativity. We have materials that are great at physics. Materials can contain information and respond to the physical environment and collaborate with those too. But the more ambitious vision is that materials are becoming the robots that we've always wanted in the mechanical sense. And if you look back at that DARPA program that I was talking about with Neil, the reconfigurable robots, many of the researchers in that program have now focused on materials, soft things, whether those are soft robotics and pneumatic systems or synthetic biology and growing materials or programmable materials and printing robots and soft, squishy things, these materials are demonstrating to us that they have more and more agency, that they can sense, actuate, and contain information, logic, and computation directly in the material itself. So the robots of the future are not the mechanical, clunky things that we thought. The robots of the future are materials. So today we build smart robots and machines and tomorrow we'll build smarter materials and environments. So maybe I'll leave it there and we can transition to Q&A. Hey, okay, wonderful. This is really exciting stuff for Scala. So I have a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, one of them was when it came to the custom fiber, if this yeast fibers actually have been applied to filters and membranes. Mm. Um, not yet, but that's exactly what we're thinking about with Ministry of Supply. Um, 
one benefit here is that if you have custom fibers and you can knit custom structures, you can then uh, morph that textile to change pore size or to change its functional characteristic for filters, for example. Um, so we, yeah, we have a proposal that we've submitted um, through AFOA and through DARPA that's specifically about that, that looks like it's going to go forward um, in chemical sensing and active textiles and garments and protective equipment based specifically on what I showed, but now for um, a protective capabilities for filtration or porosity size. Okay. I have a question here from John Roberts from our panel. So John, go yes. ahead. So uh, thank you. It was a great talk. A um, couple, of, couple of things. One is, <coughs> first part, excuse me, is from Susanna um, Bonetier. The question is, uh, have you made a building or house with the rock and string granular jamming method? And I was wondering what, what things also you can add to that to make it a permanent fixture? Yeah, definitely. Um, no, we haven't made a house yet. That project with um, Gramazio Kohler's group in, in ETH, that led to a Swiss federal grant on their side that was, I think, three or five years and funded a number of PhDs. And then on, on our side led to a DARPA grant and that now led to an Air Force grant um, with the idea being that we could rapidly build or repair. So if a runway is destroyed or damaged, can we quickly rebuild it with local materials? Or if we need to construct very, very fast uh, and deconstruct very, very fast, can we use this granular construction method as a way to do that rather than traditional concrete or brick and mortar or manual assembly like stick frame construction. So we've been focused on really taking advantage of the reversibility, but that's a trade-off. And you know, sometimes you want to build for permanence. Um, and so the easy way to build for permanence is to coat the fibers, for example. So if, if you coat the fibers, um, then you you can go a permanent route where they basically adhere to many other things. Um, and you then need to find a way to reverse it later. You could burn out the fibers or you could do something else. Um, we haven't really focused on the permanent side because one of the most important aspects for us is the reversibility and, and kind of adaptability of it. Like how do we quickly build, rebuild, with the DARPA project, we actually went into morphability so we, and modularity. We showed that you can build a column. Um, it gets stronger with load, which is really unique. So you build, you jam a column, you, you put a top and bottom plate that you compress, and now you can move it, and it acts like a typical column. You can even rotate it and walk across it like a bridge or a beam. So it acts like a, a typical concrete column if, it, if it's under load. And when you release that, it then disintegrates. So you can kind of switch it on and off. But we also showed if that you keep compressing it and you bias the compression so it's like slanted, you can get it to morph into an arch and it becomes like a semi-solid. You, um, you can sculpt it into different shapes and then you can jam it and solidify it and you can reverse it. So we've wow, been focused amazing. on those aspects rather than the permanence aspect. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me switch to another question here from the audience, which says uh, about the printing, the 3D printing. Have you done that on nanoscale or? No, we, um, we really work from, you know, millimeters are the, typically the smallest scale, but centimeters to many meters is, is the length scale that we work on. There's a, a number of amazing people that, you know, work at much smaller scales. Um, and, you know, Neil knows many of those as well. And so there's definitely people looking at um, small scale fabrication, some small scale printing, uh, a lot of people in the symbio world at the smaller scales, but all the printing work we've done is fairly macro scale. Very macro scale. Okay, great. Awesome. Are there any other questions from the panels? <laughs> yeah, close it. Great stuff. Uh, um, I, I keep thinking about all kinds of construction materials. I've, I've, been, I've, I've been involved in a lot of construction in my life. And um, uh, there was a discussion of, of filtration and others and uh, insulation. And we saw the application in textiles, you know, sweaters mm -hmm. and jackets, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, any, any thoughts going forward with uh, building insulation materials, which are just seasonally, right? You know, you got the humidity and the temperature, and then you, you have your insulation behaving accordingly, depending on what is it you're trying to accomplish. Um, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, certainly. I mean, just like the sweater, if you change uh, thickness, you can change insulation value. And so you could use that for many different things, you know, all the way up to buildings, you know, or packaging materials or, you know, planes and cars and anything where you really need to control temperature across a membrane. Um, you know, that, that's typically the easiest way to do it. Ventilation is useful for like rapid cooling. Like if you're hot and then you roll your sleeves up or, you know, you have pores in your shirt, you'll cool down quickly if there's wind and if you're moving. Um, but the insulation value is, is typically the, the best one in order to change like a temperature gradient ac across some surface. And so often that is done through thickness change. So, you know, increase the thickness change, the air gap, and you can increase the difference between inside and outside. So if we can actively tune that, we could then have, um, you know, if, it, if it's comfortable outside, instead of changing the climate control on the inside, you could actively tune the insulation value uh, for a building, for example, to be able to take advantage of, of one of the other inside or outside temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, Cheryl, you had a question. <laughs> Yes. Um, hi, th this is fabulous. And I'm, I'm in the medical healthcare field. And I'm very curious about, have you done any app used anything for applications, whether they're uh, to the human body, uh, skin protection, or changing with healing, or maybe even something internal? Yeah, um, we've done a number of projects around that direction. I mean, it's definitely not our main area of expertise, for sure. Um, but, you know, the, the human body is like kind of the perfect application for almost everything I'm talking about because it's unique. Every person's body is different inside and outside, um, which is a very different condition than a building or a car or a plane, which for the most part are going to be produced in large numbers and many of them are going to be the same. So the only difference is either the person or the environment. Um, within the human body, you know, we've talked to a number of surgeons who are interested in the 4D printing work that we did. And, um, you know, when we introduced that in, in 2013, you know, there's a few small groups doing it. Now it has really boomed and there's a, there's a big field of researchers around the world working on 4D printing. That there's like entire conferences on that and journals just on 4D printing. And I would say the most successful versions of them are in surgical or medical applications because you know, when we've talked to these doctors and surgeons, it's very clear, you know, there's a, there's a problem inside the body. It's a harsh environment that's hard to get to. Uh, you can't just like be manipulating stuff all the time. So the dream is if you can deposit something, um, give it enough information and agency so that it can solve the local problem and solve it in a way that makes sense for that condition. It doesn't need to be a standard solution. They don't even actually need to know how it solved it. They just want to enable it to solve the local problem inside the body and to adapt to whatever condition. So think about like a stent, for example, or braces are very, very like low hanging fruit, smart materials. They go from this condition to that condition. But if you can um, enhance that by having more capabilities, uh, more sensing, more actuation, different material properties, you could give it a whole range of possible scenarios. As it's deposited, it can then expand, contract, uh, change porosity or change stiffness, for example, wherever it needs to solve the local problem inside the body. So that, that's a like super clear application to the 4D printing work or any of these active smart systems. Um, externally, we've done a good, good amount of work on um, orthodontics, and prosthetics and orthotics. So these are more about like custom fit typically or like um, in the orthotics and, orth and prosthetic space, we are using the rapid liquid printing where you can take a body scan that goes to a 3D model directly to print. We can have variable thickness, variable material properties and get you a custom liner or custom orthotic in a few minutes. So typically 3D printing is like hours or days and ours is usually minutes to low hours and so we can print uh you know the same orthotic that you would get like dr shoals whatever it is or a custom liner for a prosthetic and we can print it with the exact same industrial materials in in you know a few minutes 
So we've done a good amount of work on that side, just looking at the customization of the body. Great, Scott. There's a couple of questions around you know, <clears throat> the smart materials and all the things you've shown you know, that they're mm -hmm. really fantastic. But a lot of people want to know when do we see this pretty much in consumer goods or into the market? Is there any predictions to that? Yeah, some of it um, is already there, and some of it is very soon, and others is is far off. Um, you know, I'll give you a couple caveats. So the first is that we're a research mm -hmm. lab, and you know, we always get this question. Uh, because we, we work with a lot of companies and a lot of the projects that we do are very related to real world industry problems and often, you know, look like their products. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, we're a research lab, so we don't make products. We don't ship manufacture things, but we collaborate with a lot of different companies that do. So in some ways our hands are tied, um, in how quickly it's going to make it to market because often, you know, we, we think about it like we go from a crazy idea to reality. Like we, there's some crazy vision or problem. We solve it in a really inc unconventional way and we show it's now possible and everything we do is physical. So we make functional prototypes that show it can go from here to here. It has these properties. Um, sometimes we work on the kind of medium stage development part of that. But oftentimes it then gets translated to our industry partners and then they're completely responsible for how it scales when it makes it to market, if it ever makes it to market. And so, you know, we're sort of at the mercy of that. And different industries have different timelines. Some are, you know, like cars or planes are going to be like seven plus years for the next cycle. Some are really fast, sportswear or consumer goods and clothing and some of those. Um, and that's where you'll see it a lot sooner. Like in the collaboration with Ministry of Supply, you're seeing the research translated to masks and garments very, very quickly. The other avenue we have is um, to spin out technologies and to, to form companies ourselves. And so we've, we've done that a few times where we think the, the technology is totally ripe uh, and we're the best ones suited to be able to translate it. So we, we have done that. We developed a, a company called Logic Inc. that has, uh, it's basically temporary tattoos that act as sensors. So they sense something about your body or the environment and they morph to tell you about that. So sun exposure, accumulation, uh, throughout the day or instantaneous intensity of sun uh, or alcohol con consumption or moisture and hydration. We recently spun out the liquid printing um, technology into a company. So we can also go that route, uh, but we you know don't do that that often. It's mostly in collaboration with our industry partners and we try to you know enable them and teach them how to do it and show them what are the variables in order for them to translate it to market. Okay, wonderful. I see that Eduardo is dying to ask his question. <laughs> uh, Skyler, amazing presentation. Congratulations. I have a question. You mentioned that you were working with wood on packaging, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, did you work also on smart furniture or thinking on doing something like that? We've done a couple projects around smart furniture. Um, one of them, I didn't show it here, was with a company called Woodskin. Uh, it's an Italian company. They build, it's basically flexible wood. So it's a composite where it's wood, textile wood, and it has uh, like a milled out joint. So it's almost like origami wood, if you can think about that. So that's the product that they make. And we um, developed this table with them that ships flat, and then it jumps into the shape of the table when you open the box. So one of the biggest challenges, which is you know, why IKEA addresses this and you know, almost any company that ships products around the world, a classic thing is we don't ship air or we don't want to ship air. And so that's why they often want to ship flat things to maximize the number of components in the shipping container in the truck and shipping air is really expensive. So if you can ship flat things and then it morphs and, and jumps into the shape of whatever the product. So that's one example of a, of a table that we've done, but yeah, we have worked on a number of different projects ar around furniture. Um, but with the caveat being that, you know, again, we think of smart furniture not as a bunch of sensors and actuators. Like if you just Google smart furniture, you'll get a bunch of like chairs with sensors and actuators on it, which is not what we're talking about. We're trying to think about how those pieces of furniture or whatever the product is can be, can have intelligent capabilities and agency, but it's information embedded in the materials and in the fabrication process. Okay, great. Here's another question from the audience, which talks about uh, can the active textile be woven into or incorporated into sensors like biometric sensors without compromising the nature of the textile? 
I think so. Um, it's not necessarily our area of expertise, but we've done some work with um, one of the group called Little Devices Lab. Uh, and if you remember that video, there was like a sleeve and it was white and it turned pink. So that was a, a pH sensor and a moisture sensor. So when it responds to moisture by changing uh, shape and it contracts, and then it, it responds to pH by changing color. Um, and the idea there was to make like smart bandages, for example, where it could then indicate something um, by changing, you know, sensing s something about the wound uh, or something about the, the, um, about the body. And so, uh, you know, we have done some work in that where you, it could be sensing the body or, you know, bioinformation. There's probably a lot more that you could do um, and you can use biosensors. Uh, we did some, all, some work also with the Little Devices Lab where we were printing um, DNA and proteins laced with gold nanoparticles, essentially like a pregnancy test, but we were printing it in two dimensions where it could sense other things. So um, if it found uh, exactly the right complementary pair, it would light up and show these patterns. And so, you know, very much like a 2D paper printer but we could print different diagnostics that would sense different things uh, with only the right presence, it would light up. Um, so there's, there's things like that that could be uh, kind of doped or laced into the fibers and then knit into textiles. Oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. So we can build like fibers that actually light up if you're infected by a virus or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we haven't done that uh, in the textile work, but the closest is the pH sensing in, in the sleeve that I showed. Wow, this is fantastic stuff. So thank you, Skylar. That was really, really enlightening. So uh, this concludes our today's webinar on rapid prototyping and self-assembly. Uh, so there are more webinars to come. Uh, you can find some information on our website, which is at ilp.mi2.edu.